Order. The next item of business is a motion from the Committee for Finance and Personnel on its report on the inquiry into flexible working in the public sector in Northern Ireland. The Business Committee has agreed to allow up to two hours for this debate. The proposer will have 15 minutes to propose a motion and 15 minutes to wind. All other speakers will have five minutes. Clerk, please read the motion. That this Assembly approves the report of the Committee for Finance and Personnel on its inquiry into flexible working in the public sector in Northern Ireland and calls on the Minister of Finance and Personnel, in conjunction with his executive colleagues, to implement as applicable the recommendations contained therein. I call the Chairperson of the Committee for Finance and Personnel, Mr Dahi Mackay, to move the motion. Mr Mackay. I would point out that the Committee's inquiry findings and its recommendations are both timely uh, and germane in terms of the public expenditure pr pressures we, which we are facing. Essentially, this is about how our public sector can work smarter uh, to achieve desired outcomes while using less resource and while taking account of the needs both of the business uh, and of the employees. I do not underestimate the challenge which full implementation of the inquiry recommendations will present to the Department. Uh, and indeed the wider executive. Given the cross-cutting nature of the change measures required, I expect and know uh, that resistance will emerge uh, and the silo mentality will come into play, including among, uh, amongst senior managers. Organisational culture is also notoriously difficult to change. However, it is clear from the international evidence uh, that we are behind the curve in exploiting the benefits from a strategic and coordinated application of flexible working in the public sector. The prize is too great and the medium-term budgetary outlook is too severe uh, for us to flinch from meeting this challenge. I shall refer to the case uh, for a strategic approach to flexible working in a moment, but first let me explain what exactly we mean by the term flexible working. As stated in the evidence, it is about being able to achieve desired, desired outcomes in a range of ways, being flexible, flexible about how, when and where people work. Flexible working covers a wide range of options, for example, people working part-time, job sharing, working from satellite offices, working in virtual teams, using mo mobile devices and sharing offices. While the inquiry considered all aspects of flexible working and focused on the further opportunities associated with the flexible place or location options, drawing on international lessons and expert evidence, the inquiry makes key recommendations to the department and the wider executive on how flexible working could be implemented successfully and used strategically uh, for maximum benefit and efficiency in our public sector. And I want to make it clear, Prevlas Kankori, that this is not simply about home working. Uh, some committee members had much to say uh, about that option, uh, and I'm sh sure they will wish to highlight the necessary safeguards which are recommended in the report. Rather, this is about people working smarter, be that in hub offices and rural locations, mobile working, uh, sharing office space, and using the full potential of modern technology, such as internet conferencing uh, and bespoke software solutions. The underlying aim is to match the way of working uh, with both business needs uh, and the needs of those doing the work. The Committee's evidence uh, focused on five broad themes. One, the case for flexible working. Two, existing flexible working practices in the local public sector. Three, lessons from other jurisdictions. Four, how we could implement flexible working successfully. Uh, and five, the relevance to other executive policies and priorities. Clear evidence was found of potential benefits for the employer, the employee, the economy and the environment. And these included reduced office accommodation costs, increased productivity, uh, better work-life balance, improved staff morale and commitment, reduced staff turnover and absenteeism, promotion of gender equality in employment and environmental benefits from reduced carbon footprint and congestion. There was an abundance of literature and case studies uh, demonstrating that such benefits can be realised, and that relates to both the private and the public sectors, uh, including in comparator bodies such as local councils and Whitehall departments in Britain. Uh, and to reference just a few, uh, there were the case studies within the Recruitment and Employment Confederation report highlighting that employees who, when given increased control over where, when and how they worked, uh, as well as the tasks they performed, uh, were more motivated, 
more engaged and at higher productivity as well as benefiting from a better work-life balance. The Bain Review, which highlighted improved service delivery, uh, increased public sector efficiency and effectiveness, and reduced traffic congestion and carbon footprint. Statistically, the evidence speaks for itself. Uh, for example, a Chartered Institute of Personnel and Development Survey in 2012 found that three quarters of employers reported a positive impact on talent retention, motivation and staff engagement. In financial terms, members noted the evidence on sub substantial savings potential. The Whitehall Department for Culture, Media and Sport achieved property savings estimated at £2.5 million per annum by all staff, even including uh, the permanent secretary, moving to op open plan offices, uh, together with consolidation of buildings and an increase of people working from home or at locations other than the traditional office. Uh, similarly, the Department for Children, Schools and Family implemented a desk sharing policy uh, which increased building capacity occupancy, resulting in a £10 million uh, per annum saving in property costs. Members also noted the office rationalisation achieved by Salford City Council, uh, which, with a complement of only around 4,000 office-based staff, resulted in cumulative savings of £6.5 million per annum and savings of over £5 million in capital receipts. Similarly, uh, flexible working enabled Hertfordshire County Council to move its 4,500 staff from 51 to five offices uh, and achieve annual operational cost savings of £3.8 million, property disposals totalling £40 million, in addition to reductions in travel and environmental pollutants and increased staff satisfaction. Evidence from further afield presented a similar picture, showing how comparable federal agencies in the United States achieved substantial cost savings from closing offices as a result of teleworking. And on this key issue of office accommodation savings, I would point out that we do not yet have firm figures from the Department for potential savings here in the North. The Committee has discovered that only 20 per cent of civil service office space meets workspace utilisation targets, and the traditional office is typically occupied only around 45 per cent of the time. This points clearly uh, to the possibility of significant savings being made with a more strategic approach to the way public servants work. While figures of between £30 million and £50 million pounds were suggested to the Committee in terms of the reform of property management plan, the Department needs to provide clarity not only on what are the potential total savings, but also on how and when they will be achieved. There is also a need to establish the total potential savings from the wider public sector, including arms length bodies, the health and education sectors and local government. To date, the Department's focus has been on the civil service estate, for which it has lead responsibility, but this represents only a small proportion of the overall government property portfolio. I will not labour the evidence point any further, Previous Courier. Suffice to say, uh, that in terms of the case for flexible working, uh, it confirms the assertion from Professor Bain in his initial briefing that it is more a question of how one should do this rather than whether one should do it. The Committee's cross-departmental survey uh, highlighted the ad hoc and uncoordinated nature of the flexible location working arrangements pertaining across departments. To address this and to ensure we realise the full benefits the Committee makes the following interrelated recommendations. The, the strategic direction and guiding principles must be set at the highest level in government, uh, namely within the programme for government, with departments and other public bodies provided with a menu uh, of flexible working options from which they can tailor solutions uh, to meet local business needs. There should be an onus on all departments to ensure that the work styles and tasks relating to each job role are assessed at the local level to determine the applicable flexible working practices. There should be a coordinated extension of the work hub or satellite office network involving collaboration by public bodies to improve the geographic spread of the facilities and allow a greater number and range of public ser servants to work remotely. DFP should have a lead role in proactively identifying opportunities for exploiting tech technological solutions to enable mobile or agile working in a wider range of public sector job roles. 
Internet-based or video conferencing, uh, which the committee looked at in some detail, should be the preferred method uh, for civil servants participating in the meetings, which would otherwise involve significant travel uh, in or order to maximise savings from reduced business travel costs. DFP needs to take on a central coordination role in guiding and monitoring implementation, and there should be a duty on all departments and ALBs to provide the necessary data in this regard. While I will not go into the detail now, probably the most important part of the inquiry report is the section which outlines a good practice approach to implementing flexible working, including establishing the evidence, providing the vision, managing resistance, leading change, engaging staff, assessing jobs for flexibility, managing performance by results, uh, providing appropriately designed workplaces, uh, and embracing new technology and training for change. In closing, I would emphasise that there will need to be determination on the part of both the executive and the department to ensure a truly joined-up approach to implementation. For the benefits to be maximised, a corporate approach is needed, not just within and across the civil service departments in terms of the lead functional areas of human resources, property and IT divisions, but also including uh, ALBs and local government. Finally, as highlighted in the, in the report, the coordinated rollout of the flexible location working should be, see, should be seen as an invest to save measure, which will support the delivery of a range of other government policies and priorities, not least the reform and modernisation of the public sector. A previous conquire, I look forward to hearing the contributions of members and commend the report to the House. Thank you. And I call Mr Paul Gervin. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, I think it is uh, a body of work which needed to be done, uh, and uh, it is a culture which is alive and well in the private sector. Uh, and one area that came out through the evidence that we received was that within the private sector, a very strong business case is made on each uh, incident where it is brought forward and flexible working is put in place. I unfortunately did not have the same confidence to believe that that was there within the civil servant and from a management point of view, it would need to actually ensure that the management was following what technology is available to ensure that individuals can and do, uh, do work uh, whenever they are supposed to be uh, working flexibly. Now, uh, areas of benefit and appreciate that uh, it was quite, quite an extensive piece of work undertaken by the committee and many evidence sessions were brought forward uh, and we even engaged in what is termed as video, video conferencing uh, which is uh, something which uh, I, I believe probably could be used on many occasions where savings could be made as opposed to actually uh, flying people halfway around the world to speak to individuals for a very short period of time. So uh, I think that uh, the video conferencing end seemed to be quite effective uh, and worked quite well. Now, uh, other areas uh, I believe that we, we should be looking at was the hubs that are available within the civil service currently and the usage of those hubs and feedback to ensure that a proper business case is being made for the rationalisation of the state because we have, uh, as was alluded in the report, 45 per cent of uh, the estate is not always being used. So, uh, or 45 per cent of the time. So, uh, from a consequence, from the uh, an efficiency point of view, that does not make very good business sense, uh, and I think we need to seriously look at how we can ensure that we do get that. Uh, the, unfortunately, within flexible working, there are certain areas within the civil service that cannot avail of it, and it are those maybe that are delivering service directly to the public. Uh, and I'm, I, I ju I'll just use one example. Those who want to empty the bins for a, a council cannot engage in flexible working, otherwise the bins do not get lifted. So those who will be ruled outside the opportunity to avail of this, and appreciate that uh, it seems to be geared more towards the administrative staff and management, and I think that that's an area that needs to be looked at to ensure that we are getting uh, proper delivery from uh, those areas. The satellite office opportunity is definitely there, hot desking and ensuring that people do uh, make use of it. Unfortunately, some people believe that flexible working 
is alive and well and has been alive and well within the civil service for many years. Now, uh, that, that was maybe, uh, maybe just my view. It might not necessarily be the committee's view, but I can tell you that uh, it's something where uh, we have seen the occasions whenever individuals come into the office in the morning and they put their coat over the back of a seat and they disappear for the rest of the day and people say, oh, he mustn't be too far away. His coat's there. He'll be back. So I'm really just using that as an example. But, uh, I, 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 do, I do believe that we have, to, we have to use technology. The technology is available, and the private sector do make use of this. They know when people are on their computer and what they're doing. And unfortunately, I don't believe that we are implementing that technology to the same degree. Whether it needs special negotiation with unions to ensure that there's not a snooping approach uh, towards it, but I think it's something that needs to be looked into to ensure that we have uh, the software is available and can be used to ensure that people are working and are not necessarily uh, turning on the computer in the morning and going away and doing their shopping and coming back and saying, well, look, my computer was logged on all day. I think there's opportunity there to ensure that work is being undertaken and uh, within the private sector, the outcomes are measured. And I would like to think that within the civil service and the public sector, we can ensure that those protections are given. And I think that there is savings that can be made. And yes, productivity can improve, and people will, as long as they know they have a job to do and a certain amount of time to get it done in, they will get it done. And in a uh, number of occasions, it has been demonstrated to actually be very effective uh, and uh, be far more efficient for individuals. So uh, as it stands, I think the body of work and the report as it's presented uh, it is a very true reflection of what went forward at committee. I think I, I, I support the recommendations as they were put forward. I think it, it, it will be helpful, but it does mean that we have a, a body of work to ensure that civil servants and those within management come up to the mark and ensure that we get the delivery. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Mr. Leslie Cree. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. The report before the House today represents over two years' work by the Committee on Flexible Working. The early evidence showed that the Northern Ireland uh, Civil Service did not have a formal strategy or policy on most aspects of flexible working, but did have several human resource policies in this connection. At the outset, the Committee was satisfied that the inquiry would aim to investigate how flexible working practices in all areas could be implemented successfully and used strategically for the maximum benefit and efficiency in the Northern Ireland public sector. Most people have an opinion of what is meant by flexible working, and indeed there are many definitions of it. The committee decided to look at the broadest range of factors, and this is reflected in the report. Evidence was gathered from a wide number of sources, and video conferencing and internet-based video link were used. It was particularly helpful, uh, Mr. Speaker, to be able to speak to and question experts in the field and practitioners directly involved in flexible working. Uh, the Chair has already referred to it, but I'm going to do it again. The Chartered Institute of Professional Development in their uh, recent survey of over 1,000 employers and 2,000 employees found that three quarters of UK employers feel that implementing flexible working practices has had a positive impact on talent retention. 73% report a positive impact on motivation and staff engagement. More than half of the employees felt that flexible working helped them reach a better work-life balance generally, and almost a quarter said that flexible working helped them with their caring responsibilities for children. More than one-third of those that responded believed flexible working made them more productive, and around a fifth said that it reduced the level of sickness absence. In the public sector, the committee noted that as part of the civil service reform programme, the Cabinet Office adopted the smart working policy approach for Whitehall, Depart Whitehall departments. The purpose is to change the way work is carried out by focusing on the achievement of certain benefits. And I'll just mention those quickly. Increasing the effectiveness of the activities, reducing the financial costs of running an organisation, focusing on outcomes rather than processes, a very important one, meeting the aspirations of staff for an improved work-life balance, creating office environments that facilitate collaboration and innovation, and reducing the environmental footprint of working practices. So it's not just working from home as opposed to working in an office. 
Sir George Bain summed it up when he said that it was more a question of how rather than whether flexible working should be involved. The committee carried out its own survey of flexible working in the various government departments as there was no meaningful information held centrally. This produced evidence that the Northern Ireland Civil Service does use part-time working, flexi-time, term-time working, career breaks and other alternative working patterns. But it was also clear that there was an absence of corporate policy and guidance which was reflected by incomplete data on existing working practices. Evidence was also gathered from other parts of the world where flexible working had been introduced successfully. However, culture change was a vital part of the overall change management process in most places. The committee firmly believe <clears throat> that the strategic implementation of flexible working facilitated by appropriately designed workplaces will maximise the property savings from the rationalisation of government office accommodation. This should be a key priority for the department at this time of tight budgetary pressures. However, the main reason for flexible working is about doing things better by cutting out waste from existing resources and embracing new technology. Unfortunately, the public sector in Northern Ireland appears to lag behind other jurisdictions in adopting new technology to support working practices. This is despite the fact that we have high-profile local software companies in this market. The implementation of the inquiry recommendations will also support the delivery of a range of the executive's existing policies and priorities. The People's Strategy 2013-16, the reduction of levels of sickness absence, the Measuring Wellbeing Initiative, the consolidation of the Northern Ireland Civil Service Estate and the wider public sector reform agenda. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I support the committee's report and commend it to the House. Thank you. And I call Ms. Judith Cochran. I hope we didn't disturb you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, and I welcome the opportunity to um, add some comment um, to this debate on the report on the inquiry into flexible working in the public sector in Northern Ireland. The context for the inquiry um, has already been set um, and stated by others and it's important to note that whilst the committee examined the full range of flexible working opportunities, there was a particular focus on flexible working locations such as satellite offices and shared office space. And this is the area which potentially creates the greatest opportunities for savings but also benefits for staff. It's also important to note that a one-size-fits-all policy approach in this matter um, is not appropriate as any flexible working practices need to be designed in line with business need. And therefore, any progress on this matter could actually face some stumbling blocks quite early on, um, as there's often a, a drive for uniformity at times over and above considering actual business need. Mr. Dep Deputy, Principal Deputy Speaker, there's no doubt that um, the need for flexible working is growing. We're no longer a, a nine to five world and demands for access to services and information are increasing. And the public sector um, has a role there too to consider how it is delivering its services. During the evidence session, we heard of many of the benefits of flexible working arrangements, including increased uh, employee productivity, better business continuity, reduced work-related travel, greater retention and more women in senior roles, which are all worthy in outcomes. However, even when the benefits of flexible working arrangements are clear on paper, the ability to successfully embed them can be hampered by a number of barriers. The most commonly cited barriers tend to be cultural in nature. And unfortunately, public sector culture is probably the most difficult to crack in comparison to other sectors. This can be due to low staff turnover, which is often seen as a positive workplace trait. However, it also means that work patterns have often become entrenched over the years. And this problem of a stagnant corporate culture can be further compounded, as there are few opportunities for entry at all levels into the civil service. And therefore, we're losing the opportunity to bring new, fresh thinking to challenge the, the old ways of doing things. And if we're to achieve a culture of flexibility, public sector organisations need to become more agile so that they're able to constantly innovate around employee working arrangements. I believe that the Minister does understand this and this is one of the reasons behind him setting up the Public Sector Reform Division, which has a specific aim to help stimulate innovation in service delivery and policy design. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, current working practices often dictate 
the need for allocated desk space. However, this need is often based on the, on the amount of staff-owned paperwork. And in many cases, uh, these spaces can be unoccupied for a, a significant part of the day. So there's a real opportunity to rationalise workspace requirements across our public sector, but at the same time, capitalise on the benefits of staff not always having to travel to specific office locations, which are often Belfast-centred. Indeed, we could be losing out in vital talent who live further afield, but who um, are not able to travel um, every day. And therefore, we need to fully explore and embrace technology so that we can deliver flexibility. And I believe that we're still some way off in where we should be on this. But again, it's actually not that easy to achieve in practice. In a, in a previous role, I was involved in implementing the electronic document record management system in the civil service. Um, and although many would agree it's good practice to, to save uh, your, work place, your work into a shared space, firstly for business continuity purposes, um, but also um, to allow quicker information sharing, um, the, this was really met um, with, a, with a lot of resistance. And if we're to succeed in this area, uh, lessons need to be learned from these type of projects. We're often project staff and we're concerned with ticking boxes at project board meetings than actually ensuring the technology is configured uh, to take into account the various idiosyncrasies of different business areas. So actually having project team staff who have the skills to draw out information from staff and feed this into the development process makes it more likely that the technology will succeed. And at the end of the day, it's technology like this that will better allow for flexible working in the future. And if we're going to invest millions of pounds in it, then we need to make sure we utilise its full benefits. So, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, this inquiry has raised a number of an interesting issues and opportunities for change. And our goal should be that the, the civil service and the wider public sector should strive for operational excellence. We therefore ask the Minister for Finance and Personnel to examine the recommendations in the report and implement any changes that will create maximum benefit and efficiency in the public sector. I call Ms. Michaela Boyle. I rise to support the motion as a member of the DFP committee. Uh, Deputy Speaker, as previous speakers alluded to, the different groups and organisations that came and gave evidence to the committee and to flexible working in the public sector. And, uh, there was one of the earliest briefings um, in the committee um, which unfortunately I wasn't uh, able to attend that day due to a family bereavement, but looking back in Hansard, um, it was from Andy Lake of flexibility.co.uk. He gave the committee a step-by-step -step, uh, guide on how flexible working can look like, and that was one of the earliest evidence sessions. And I think looking at that, you, you know, there has been a lack of understanding without many organisations and departments and how this, this could be exactly what flexible, flexible working patterns and, and working could look like. But Mr Lake's organisation produced a, a document uh, entitled The Smart Working Handbook. Uh, and, and I did look at that document um, after he came to the committee. The document um, had been customised to suit many of the organisations and departments that his company was working with and indeed was used as an internal uh, guidance on flexible working patterns across many departments and organisations. He also spoke of the overall emphasis from within Whitehall um, around uh, how this is part of the efficiency and reform uh, programme under which flexible, flexible working sits. And one of the, I suppose, main or many driving factors from within the government uh, across uh, GB is to reduce property costs. And we heard how the chair of the uh, committee spoke about that um, here today. Ken Kolya, of course, within the public sector, our public sector workforce here, there are many practical ways in which time can be managed better and each department or organisation have their own mechanisms in place as we have heard on how they can deal with this. Um, people do spend a lot of time doing things that they feel that are not entirely necessary within their working day um, as they have been involved in a system and a process that has been uh, designed, adopted and, and put in place and passed on uh, throughout their work life and indeed you know, some continue to do that. They've always been doing things the same in, in the way they work. Um, 
So we need to challenge this, and I think you know, we can manage our, challenge it so that we can manage our time and our work ethic and, and improve upon our work output as, as, as we do. Uh, members in the committee asked numerous questions, and I think it was Mr. Cree asked the question um, on, on uh, how do managers know that members of staff are actually working when they should be working and, and not doing other things. And I think you know there's been a lot of there was a lot of talk within committee on how that could be addressed, and indeed the satellite system and shared space and all of that, and, and I suppose um, looking at putting in place. Um, work guidance and templates to make sure that people are doing what they are doing you know and again the reduced property costs a good working environment and the health benefits also um, less stress and better motivation of staff and an overall improved work-life balance all of those things were discussed within committee from member from many of the uh, evidence sessions that we we took um, I suppose the report that we have before us today is a culmination of all the good work that was undertaken by the committee over a couple of years and indeed um, many respondents to the inquiry were very positive on it and, and I suppose what struck me was how well flexible work suited families and indeed uh, it helped with childcare arrangements and reduced costs and I think it's fair to say that um, Thinking from a rural perspective, from where I come from, west of the band, the amount of civil servants travelling west of the band, um, I know would welcome these reforms and uh, on flexible working, and they would be willing to engage in that, you know, from a sub office uh, in, in my area, and it would prove to them that it is not all Belfast Central, and that Straban can avail of this. <laughs> I will indeed. I'm sure the member, as a, someone who would frequently get stuck on the M2 or the M1 in the morning, uh, would also benefit from flexible working. Uh, I, I don't know what the, the, the minister's view is in, in terms of members of this house, but uh, I think as well the member touches on a good point. Uh, I mean, frequently we uh, face issues in this assembly in terms of transport infrastructure and congestion. If we implement flexible work, and surely that will forego the need for. Uh, more money to be spent on inf infrastructure in the future and addressing congestion on our roads? Absolutely, I certainly agree. And, and, and maybe one thing that the Minister may take into account is maybe a sub office of Stormont, maybe west of the band, would, would certainly help myself and other members that have to travel here two hours every day. Um, <laughs> members, uh, can call you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there has to be an onus on departments and organisations as to how they would facilitate or accommodate those, even you know, coming from a rural area and indeed those with the disabilities. So I commend the committee and, uh, for the work that they have done on this and indeed our clerks as well for, for the research that they have done onto this. So, uh, Gorm Ogut, and I commend the report to the House. Thank you. And I call the Minister of Finance and Personnel, Mr Simon Hamilton. Looking around the chamber uh, this afternoon, it would appear that many of our colleagues are adopting a flexible working approach uh, to, to this debate. In, in the spirit of, of, of flexible working, I had contemplated at one stage uh, of perhaps uh, giving my contribution via teleconferencing while I remained at home today, or alternatively, perhaps I could have read three fifths of my response and give Mr. McAlveen the remaining two fifths. But um, given that we are trying to work flexibly here within the, the time before question time, I will, I will proceed just uh, conventionally. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I very much welcome the opportunity to speak on this motion. As, as members will know, I am a firm believer in exploiting new ideas and technologies in order to ensure that we deliver the best possible service in the most efficient way. The Northern Ireland civil service and the wider public sector can achieve additional benefits through the increased use of flexible working practices. I feel it is important that we evaluate and implement the proposals where it is appropriate and cost-effective to do so. However, this flexible working report highlights a wide range of uh, issues and contains a number of associated recommendations. In order to fully respond to this debate, I'd like to take, uh, set out and address the key points separately. Firstly, I think it is important to highlight the range of working practices that are currently available in the Northern Ireland Civil Service to support staff in the balance between their work commitments and life responsibilities. I was pleased to note that the committee's report uh, commends the civil service for being at the forefront of the introduction of flexible time working practices and acting as an exemplar organisation in this respect. 
potential benefits of flexible working are wide-ranging, and my department acknowledges those identified in the report. From a purely HR perspective, they include improved staff morale and commitment, reduced staff turnover and absenteeism, improved work-life balance, wider recruitment talent pools, and promotion of gender equality and employment. In recognition of these benefits, civil services already implemented a number of alternative working patterns under the umbrella of flexible working. And these include flexible hours or flexi time, compressed hours and personalized hours, part-time working including job sharing and term time working and partial retirement. The majority of civil service employees can avail of at least one of these schemes and there is no doubt that they have a uh, positive impact on the work-life balance of staff. For example, the results of last year's staff survey showed that over 60% of staff agreed that they achieve a good balance between their work life and private life. In addition to the alternative working patterns on offer, my department has also been extremely proactive in exploiting new technology to support flexible working practices. I was therefore very disappointed to note, and I must take issue with the report's assessment that the Northern Ireland public sector appears to be lagging behind other jurisdictions. To the contrary, Deputy Speaker, the Northern Ireland Civil Service is very much a leader in this respect. Not only has it identified the opportunities presented by new technology, it has implemented several as proof of concepts or live running. These include satellite working, home working, video conferencing, instant messaging, mobile devices and Wi-Fi. My department in particular has supported the civil service in a number of different ways to enable flexible working, and these include making it easier for, for uh, staff to work from different locations by implementing network and I across all Northern Ireland civil service sites, providing a BlackBerry service which provides secure access to the Northern Ireland Civil Service services such as an uh, email from a smartphone or tablet device, and developing and supporting unified communications which includes a range of tools uh, to enable flexible and agile working. We've introduced business zones or hubs to enable staff to work remotely at a location that is more suitable for them while still meeting their business objectives. The business zone in Marlborough House, Craig Avon, for example, is well utilised by a, a wide range of public sector staff. On average, it had around 200 visits each month in the first half of this financial year. Now, there is also a hub at uh, Castle Buildings, and there is a small facility as well for laptop users at Academy House in Ballymena. Uh, we have supported uh, flexible and agile working across a number of departments. These include school inspectors in the Department of Education, who are home-based planning uh, staff in the Department of the Environment who use video conferencing to manage teams in remote locations, and staff in a range of departments such as DAR, DOE, DRD and DFP who use mobile technology to help with their day-to-day -day jobs including surveys, assessments and enforcement. In my own department, IT staff have adopted a, an element of teleworking including NA Direct staff who have daily team meetings uh, between staff in Belfast and, and Londonderry to allow them to work closer to home. The evaluation of the teleworking initiative, which uh, was initially run as a pilot, demonstrates that it has been a success. Benefits include a, an enhanced work-life balance, increased flexibility in working arrangements to meet business needs, and contribution towards some of the aims of the government's green transport goals and objectives. My department introduced a centralised video conferencing service at the beginning of 2012. This service continues to grow, and although some standalone facilities still exist within departments, a large number of units have been migrated into the central structure. In the last year alone, almost 4,000 meetings were hosted by this service. The report expresses the view that internet-based conferencing should be, preferred, should be the preferred method for civil servants participating in meetings which involve travel outside of Northern Ireland. I'd like to advise that internet-based web conferencing is already supported and has been available for some time in the Northern Ireland Civil Service using the WebEx product. We are continuing to improve this service and plans are well advanced to introduce an internal web conferencing facility which will also have the capability to include people from outside the Northern Ireland Civil Service. I believe that this approach will help address any security concerns in relation to this uh, current product and will result in a more extensive use of the facility. The examples I've just given show that the technology and security controls are already in place within the civil service to support flexible working. In addition, the new performance management system also supports the principle of flexible working as staff productivity and performance is measured by a range of outputs and objectives which should not be influenced by where a person is located. However, in all of the flexible working options that I have noted, there is a guiding and overriding principle that cannot be ignored. Flexible working solutions should only be implemented where there is no adverse impact on the service provided to the public or on the overall efficiency of the department concerned. I note that the report recommends that DFP should take lead responsibility for monitoring and reporting on the implementation of flexible working measures. However, it is widely acknowledged that some areas of work, uh, and particularly jo uh, frontline jobs, are not suitable for flexible working arrangements, a uh, point made by, by Mr. Garvin and his contribution. 
This was recognised as well by the committee when they reported that a one-size-fits-all approach is not appropriate and that the focus should be on selecting the appropriate working options and technologies which meet business needs. And, and I was interested in, Mr. W. Speaker, in researching this, that there, there are a number of private sector companies, most notably Yahoo, who have moved in the opposite direction, who have ended flexible working uh, as recently as uh, February of last year, in part because their, their belief was that some of the best ideas and uh, best decisions were taken actually in, in places like the cafeteria and hallways and as people bumped into each other throughout the workplace uh, and the need for you know, their feeling that impromptu team meetings and uh, were, weren't happening and there was a reduced creativity and there was less camaraderie among staff uh, as well as a result of, of having flexible working. Mr. Deputy Speaker, individual departments are in the best position to examine the feasibility of enhanced flexible working in relation to their business processes. They are also best placed to assess the costs and benefits of additional flexible working practices and to develop the associated business case. If we add an additional monitoring and reporting role for DFP, there is a danger that we could be introducing an additional level of unnecessary bureaucracy into this process. I therefore feel that this proposal needs further consideration in order to develop the most appropriate approach. Likewise, I think that the proposal for a new programme for government commitment in relation to flexible working also needs careful uh, examination. I recognise that flexible working is an important issue which should be considered and addressed. However, I am not sure that a PFG commitment is an appropriate mechanism for doing this. PFG targets should be about the level of service delivered to the people of Northern Ireland, not on the internal processes used to deliver these services. I acknowledge the Committee's view that there is potential savings uh, to be made by utilising a more flexible or agile work style. However, these savings will only be achieved if there is a net reduction in office accommodation space. We should not have a situation whereby one person holds a workstation in their normal office space as well as in a remote location. Uh, the, the Chair mentioned uh, about re reducing the size of the footprint. That's something that our, the asset management strategy, which he will be familiar with, uh, is trying to do on an ongoing basis, where we're putting in uh, to workplace NIE standards, open plan office accommodation. The, Minister will know, or the member will know uh, that I myself have an open plan office and I in, in Clare House. Um, uh, even though I have to sometimes look out and see Mr. McElveen uh, looking back at me, I think it's a price worth paying to, to, to lead by example. Uh, it should, Mr. Deputy Speaker, be the responsibility of each department to evaluate how enhanced flexible working, benefits can, uh, working can benefit their business and make an informed decision on whether or not to support a more flexible or agile work style. DFP will certainly provide the technologies to support this work if a suitable business case has been produced. We will also continue to promote staff awareness of civil service flexible working practices through ongoing staff communications. In closing, the flexible working report contains many useful observations and proposals. My department has already introduced a range of schemes and technologies to facilitate working in the civil service and has addressed some of the issues highlighted in the report. I assure you that we will continue to keep pace with developments in this area and will introduce new policies and technologies in relation to flexible working as the need arises. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Mr Dominic Bradley, the Deputy Chair of the Committee, to conclude and wind on the debate. And if I could remind the member that we will be stopping at 2 p.m. for question time. If the member has not concluded his remarks, he will be called immediately after question time. Thank you. This indeed has been a very useful debate on the Committee's inquiry report, and I would like to thank the members and the Minister for their contributions. As the Chair earlier indicated, the recommendations aim to help DFP and the wider executive to implement flexible working successfully and strategically for maximum benefit and efficiency in the public sector here. But this will require a joined up approach within and across departments and the wider public sector. It has been acknowledged that the challenge of this task is considerable and we can expect resistance to the change. Given the need to work beyond the silos in a collective and coordinated way, we can expect that perceived barriers will be identified and plausible reasons will be offered for why this project cannot progress as envisaged. The short answer, of course, is that comparable public sector bodies in other places are already reaping the rewards from successful implementation of a strategic and comprehensive approach to flexible working. Nonetheless, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I think it is important that I close today's debate by reflecting on some of the potential barriers which may arise, some of which have been referenced in today's debate. We need to be clear on how these can be addressed. While the inquiry report outlines the good practice steps 
and change measures required. There is plenty of detailed guidance and literature available to support public sector managers in this regard. In particular, I would point to the Guide to Smart Working in Government, which was prepared for Whitehall departments last year. And as has been identified, probably the greatest barrier uh, or challenge is in bringing about the necessary cultural change in public bodies uh, and also in management, uh, managing resistance, including at senior and middle management level. I think if we are serious about, uh, serious about achieving the benefits and savings, the executive ministers need to be clear and determined in setting this as a priority for the senior civil service. Senior managers must uh, lead the change by effectively communicating the vision and the benefits, uh, by leading by example, by meaningful and early engagement with staff and their representatives, and by providing the necessary training and support. Uh, everyone must be clear that this offers a win-win outcome. We have noted that there can be opposition to open plan offices. Uh, which are a necessary element of smart, work, smart workplace design. But we have seen from the evidence on best practice design uh, that there needs to be a mixture of different spaces, with each addressing the particular uh, needs of workers. For example, uh, meeting spaces, breakout rooms, quiet rooms, multi-purpose areas to ensure the most effective use of space. We have seen that there also needs to be give and take on the part of employees. This new way of working involves a change of mindset. Gone are the days when people can expect to come into work to their own dedicated desk or office, which, uh, as we have noted, are typically occupied only about 45 per cent of the time. So in return for the personal benefits from flexible working, including improved work-life balance and reduced travel, employees will need to demonstrate flexibility on their part. Another perceived barrier is that only certain types of public sector jobs are suitable to flexible working. The evidence shows that this can be used as a cop-out. It has been shown that by assessing and breaking down the work styles and tasks of job roles, flexibility can be applied to certain aspects of public, public sector roles which would be less obviously suited to flexible working, such as teachers and doctors. In such cases, it may be only parts of a job that are suitable, but no assumptions should be made about people or roles before undertaking a transparent assessment of the job tasks. We have heard how there needs to be a cultural shift away from management by presence to management by results. The argument uh, that the performance of root workers can be too difficult to manage is another fallacy. In fact, one could argue that performance management should always be based on results and outcomes. Irrespective of the job role or where it is undertaken, both the manager and the job holder should be clear on what is expected in terms of uh, quantity and quality of work or output to be delivered and appropriate measures should be in place. We have noted that having more people working in different places and at different times should be seen as an opportunity to tighten things up and get more uh, systematic in terms of performance management. Also, we have heard how safeguards can be applied in terms of new ways of keeping in contact with staff, including teamwork protocols, such as shared calendars, and modern technology means that monitoring is possible no matter where an employee works. When considering the perceived barriers regarding job suitability and managing performance of remote workers, it must also be remembered that uh, flexible working lo uh, locations, including home working, is already happening in the civil service. The difference is that this is currently not being controlled are monitored centrally. Uh, the laissez-faire approach whereby arrangements are left to be agreed at line management levels arises from the absence of corporate policy and guidance and is reflected by incomplete data on existing practices. It is not evident 
that any safeguards are in place to ensure uh, fairness and cons consistency of approach or for effective performance management. The implementation of the inquiry recommendations would serve to address this weakness and mitigate the risks while maximising the benefits. A further barrier which has been noted is in terms of costs of implementing the proposals. The committee has acknowledged that these could be significant, including in terms of property design, new equipment, facilities costs and project management costs. We are all too aware that departments are under se severe budgetary pressure, which, according to the Finance Minister, will continue for some years to come. The Committee has emphasised, however, that the initial outlay should be seen as an invest-to-save measure in view of the resultant savings and other significant benefits in the longer term. Consider the annual savings in office accommodation costs and capital receipts which have been realised by Whitehall departments and local councils in Britain, and as indicated in the Chairman's opening remarks also. This could be replicated here together with other benefits for public sector employers and staff, but only if the consolidation of property and the rollout of smart workplace design is accompanied with a strategic and coordinated uh, application of flexible working practices. Uh, in launching the draft budget 2015-16, the Minister referred to the Change Fund, which is tailored specifically uh, towards reform-oriented projects that are innovative, involve collaboration between departments and agencies, or focus on prevention. Perhaps that may offer an appropriate source of funding for some costs associated with the proposals. Moreover, we should be mindful that there is less pressure on the capital side of the budget and the potential for longer-term savings can be ignored. Uh, in conclusion, I would emphasise the point made earlier in the debate that we are lagging behind other jurisdictions in exploit exploiting the benefits from a strategic approach. In particular, Whitehall departments are stealing a march on us. Now we have the opportunity through this inquiry report to exploit the synergy with the other executive policies and priorities, particular, the, particularly the Minister's public sector reform agenda. Uh, the committee looks forward to receiving a formal response to the inquiry report after the department has reflected on the evidence and the recommendations therein. I would therefore uh, commend the report to the House and ask for support for the committee's motion. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you very much. The question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Thank you very much. The House will take its ease as we prepare for.